Okay, so first of all, I'd like to welcome you all here today for another SUP lecture. Today, we have the pleasure and honor to have Professor Andreas Fickers with us. Um, I'm now briefly going to introduce Professor Fickers, and then I'll give him the floor for his presentation. And then we'll have about 20 minutes, uh, perhaps a little bit more, depending um, on how much time Professor Fickers needs. Uh, for questions and answers. So thank you all for being here. Uh, professor Fickers, it's an honor. Um, professor Fickers is a professor for contemporary and digital history and founding director of the Luxembourg Center for Contemporary and Digital History, C2DH, the third interdisciplinary center of the University of Luxembourg. His research focuses on European history of technology, mainly communication technologies, transnational and intermedial media history, experimental media archaeology, digital history and hermeneutics, and transmedia storytelling and history. Um, some of his current research projects include popular cultural transnational in the popular cultural transnational in the long 60s, doing experimental media archaeology and a doctoral training unit on digital history and hermeneutics. Uh, he is editor-in-chief of the multi-layer journal of the digital history and co-author of more recently Communicating Europe Technologies Information Events. Professor Fickers, you have the floor. Once again, thank you for being here for the steep lectures. Yeah, thank you, uh, Barbara and, and Clara, for the invitation. For me, it's an honor as well to, to be with you tonight. Uh, although I would have preferred to be in the beautiful Lisbon uh, and to, to be face to face. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's really good uh, to see uh, you online. Uh, and also a special hello to Maria Paula, who I see. Hi, <laughs> Andrea, you know, how are you? <laughs> nice to you know see you. Each other for a very long yeah. time. And uh, <laughs> so it's, it's a pleasure to to see you and to speak to you tonight. It is a pleasure to have you here in our research unit. We would prefer to have you in Lisbon, actually, but, <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, try to, um, to share now my uh, screen so that you can see uh, the PowerPoint presentation. And I will go in the presentation mode. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, the topic I would like to discuss with you uh, tonight is a topic that, um, yeah, is part of my, my own research uh, agenda for, yeah, I would say some 10, 15 years uh, uh, now. Yeah, I'm, I'm trained as a historian of technology, but worked mainly on communication technologies. That's why I moved also from the field of history of technology to the field of, of media history, trying to, uh, to combine those, uh, those fields in my research. And uh, the topic of tonight, really experimental media archeology span is um, yeah, a result of that uh, idea or that um, ambition to combine these two different perspectives with uh, a form of hands-on history, which is, uh, I think, um, an interesting way of studying uh, the past of media technologies. So what I want to do tonight is to first uh, give you some, uh, share some ideas about why experimental media archaeology might be an interesting approach in also for historians of, of science and technology. Then more specifically to uh, share some thoughts on the heuristic potential of reenactments or hands-on uh, history. And here to more specifically introduce the concept of thinkering that we use as a theoretical framing. Uh, then I will uh, reflect on yeah, the necessity of deoritizing uh, maybe uh, objects of, of history of technology and putting our hands on. So uh, it's a plea of getting stuff out of the vitrines of museums and, and rather really use it for uh, experimental research. Uh, 
yeah, and I will conclude then with some more general reflections. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, this, uh, this topic uh, of um, working with objects as historical sources is something that um, I started appreciating very early on in my uh, career. At the end of my master's uh, studies uh, um, in Aachen, in Germany, I did a, a two-year practical course at the Deutsches Museum in Munich. Uh, so it's one of the oldest and yeah, quite well-known museums of science and technology. And there really I, I got um, interested in using historical objects, technological ob objects as really sources for studying uh, the past. And also uh, to think about how we could possibly uh, get to know past usages uh, of these objects. So not just studying the object as such, how, how it works, how it functions, uh, but also yeah, what people uh, did with these objects. And as you know, this is, uh, this is probably one of the hardest things for historians to reconstruct past uh, practices uh, or usages. So in, in, in some, some articles, I started thinking about, yeah, how can we get closer to that past usage uh, by studying different kinds of, of sources that tell us something about users. And uh, in doing so, I, I tried to develop a kind of typology of uh, how different kinds of sources uh, represent also specific types of, of past users. For example, think of um, um, imagined users that we find in, in science fiction or in utopian literature. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff around of, about imagined use. Uh, then we have the source genre of advertisements, uh, which are often used also in cultural history of technology, but these advertisements, of course, present us a configured user, not the real user. Um, then we have expert users as we can find them, for example, in, in technical journals or scientific uh, publications uh, um, and so on. So I tried really to, to develop that kind of typology and one typo type of, of user that uh, usage that uh, I was very much interested in was what we call then reenacted use. So how can we learn something about the past by yeah, putting our hands on uh, these uh, past media technology objects? Uh, and yeah, what can we possibly uh, learn from such uh, hands-on history uh, that enriches the, the uh, perspectives we know from studying other sources? Um, so, Experimental media archaeology, how we call it, um, is of course influenced by the, the field of, of media archaeology, uh, which is an established field within, uh, within media history and media studies. Um, yeah, there are various approaches around, uh, think about uh, Kittler's work uh, or Zielinski's, or more recently, Erki Utamo's. Uh, work on experiment on media archaeology. And they all were very much interested in, in the materiality of uh, technology and technological objects, but they were mainly studying that materiality by looking at texts and not by putting their hands on, uh, on these objects uh, as such. Um, the, the common uh, tenor of that um, approach was that yeah, they wanted to move away from, let's say, classical media historiography or and even history of technology, uh, which um, until I would say the 1980s was still uh, strongly uh, driven by, uh, by by teleological narratives of, of uh, yeah inventions and innovations and 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 yeah histories of progress. Um, they were way more interested in. Um, what they called in, uh, possible histories of media use, 
um, technologies that had never seen uh, or were never turned into really mass media or in successful innovations, but remained uh, more uh, hidden inventions. So it was also seen in that sense by Wolfgang Ernst as a critique of, of media history in the, in the narrative uh, mode. Um, I fully agree with those authors that uh, we can learn a lot by, by doing such discourse uh, analysis, also about yeah, uh, the materiality of things, uh, that it helps to reconstruct what Reinhard Koselek has uh, called the, the horizon of expectation, uh, which is a constitutive element in the process of yeah, symbolic engineering and even intellectual appropriation of new uh, technologies, but it remains discourse based. Uh, and in that sense, um, uh, classical uh, uh, media archaeology is, is very close to uh, the idea of history as reenactment, as uh, Roger Collingwood has defined it in his famous uh, book, The Idea of History in, in 46. Uh, I will quote here. Historical knowledge is the knowledge of what mind has done in the past. And at the same time, it is the redoing of this, the perpetuation of past acts in the present. Its object is therefore not a mere object, something outside the mind which knows it. It's an activity of thought, which can be known only in so far as the knowing mind reenacts it and knows itself as doing so. Um, so, for, for Collingwood, doing history is that kind of mental reenactment uh, uh, that brings us uh, closer to the past and that uh, helps us to, end us to finally understand the past in a, in a hermeneutic uh, tradition. So experimental media archaeology, um, yeah, tries to go beyond that idea of mental uh, reenactment as um, yeah, a pure uh, heuristic method based on, 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 on uh, this mental reenactment and is more interested in what uh, the German philosopher Ernst Cassirer uh, described as uh, begreifen or erfassen um, of uh, the reality. And I will read this quote in, in German. I, I'm sure that you're not familiar with the German, but uh, it's really terms that are hardly to translate in, in English. He wrote, Alle geistige Bewältigung der Wirklichkeit ist an diesen doppelten Akt des Fassens gebunden, an das Begreifen der Wirklichkeit im sprachlich-theoretischen Denken und an ihr Erfassen durch das Medium des Wirkens, an die gedankliche wie die technische Form geht. So here, um, maybe the closest, the best translation of this idea of Begreifen uh, uh, in German is grasping, and Cassiel says, if you want to grasp uh, reality and also past realities, uh, you have to do this kind of double act of grasping, one which is more theoretical, theoretical mental, and the other is really by uh, studying the, uh, what he calls technische Formgebung, the technical uh, uh, forms, or the, the physical reality. And that's by investing your senses uh, and uh, also putting your hands on. So experimental media archeology span combines this idea of reenactment as explorative mode of historical interpretation with the, what we call experimental mode of historical knowledge generation. So we want, really to turn the historian, uh, um, not in, just have him as a, a more observer of the past, but turn him into an active uh, experimenter and to also turn the archive into uh, a laboratory uh, for doing historical uh, research. And I very much like um, here a book by the French um, philosopher and historian of science, Michel uh, Serre, who in uh, his book, The Five Senses, he has really uh, developed a plea uh, that we have to go beyond what he calls 
um, the prison of words and, and language to grasp uh, reality. And he uh, wrote that we need a kind of second tongue. Uh, and he uses the, the wonderful example of wine tasting to describe this. He says, yeah, generally you show your connoisseurship uh, of, of wine uh, when you produce nice uh, descriptions about it. You can yeah, tell stories about how, how it smells and tastes. So it's the tongue that produces words, language that shows uh, expertise, but he says, uh, we need the second tongue that, that tastes, that explores, and that keeps silent uh, to uh, really grasp uh, other dimensions of, of reality. Uh, and this uh, was for me really a, a, an inspiration also for doing uh, um, the hands-on history. But yeah, this is this is um, this reads nicely. <laughs> it sounds great, but how how to grasp then the the sonic, the haptic, the sensorial dimension of of objects? <clears throat> and here we um, um, the center also that you introduced. Uh, uh, we we really use that concept of of thinkering as a kind of yeah philosophy for what we aim uh, doing. Thinkering is composed of yeah, tinkering, this more playful, uh, yeah, playing around with uh, technology and thinking the critical reflection on what uh, technology means. And this combination, thinkering, uh, that was introduced by Erki uh, Utamo uh, in one of his writings is, has really become a kind of, yeah, you could say philosophy for what we try uh, doing at, at the center. You have other terms that are um, close to that, for example, the term bricolage uh, that was introduced by Levi Strauss, for example, or others, but yeah, we use uh, thinkering uh, as, as this term uh, that really um, yeah, aims at uh, actively co-constructing uh, our epistemic uh, object under uh, scrutiny. Mm, it's really important here, I will come back to this later, that these uh, hands-on experiments, this uh, uh, reenactments that we do have not the aim to produce a kind of authentic historical uh, experience. This is by definition impossible, as we know. And so um, very often when people uh, hear the term reenactment, especially professional historians, they become a bit allergic uh, because it's, uh, yeah, they think about this kind of festive uh, stagings of, of battles or, or other things that are more um, related to um, theme parks and amusement parks, but not to serious historical uh, research. Uh, but for us, uh, reenactment means um, hands-on experimentation, which creates a different kind of knowledge, a kind of factual knowledge, Handlungswissen, that reflects the performative qualities of objects and the co-constructive role of the human and the object in interaction. And one of the main, I think, uh, um, heuristic potentials of that is the, what we call the art of failure, because very often when you do these things, they don't work as expected. Uh, things don't develop as planned. And I think this is uh, something, an, imp an important also lesson you learn when doing hands-on history. And that brings you maybe closer to past realities because very often technology fails. Uh, and uh, this is something that is not so prominent in uh, the historiography of um, technology. So this was really uh, um, then how the project that um, I would talk, like to talk a little bit about came to, to being uh, the so-called DEMA project, doing experimental media archaeology archaeology. It was a, uh, a three-year funded project by the uh, Luxembourgish uh, Research Foundation, FNR, 
uh, with uh, mainly two postdoc uh, researchers. Here on the, on the left uh, of the photo, you see Alex uh, Kolkowski, uh, a uh, postdoc from, uh, from who worked a lot in the London Science Museum, a specialist in, in sound technologies. And then uh, on the second of the right, Tim van der Heiden, a former PhD student of mine, uh, who did his PhD on the history of amateur films. And he, in this project, focused on early film uh, technologies. Um, yeah, Stefan Krebs, uh, the second from left, is, uh, was together with me, the co coordinator of the project. And very recently on the, the right side, Christian Bleileven uh, also uh, supported us in, in organizing uh, the final conference that we hosted like a month ago in, in Luxembourg. Um, so this project produced, I think, uh, a lot of interesting outputs that you can see on the website. Uh, so we have uh, lots of videos also of, of, of the kind of experiments we have been uh, realizing within the project. There are uh, reports about uh, workshops um, and activities. So if you're interested uh, in this, please have a look at uh, the, the website. And we got great support also from our advisory board. Uh, John Ellis, for example, from, from London, who did a fantastic project uh, about um, yeah, television technology, how to produce television in the 1960s, or Laurie Emerson. She's running the Media Lab in Colorado Boulder based on, on computer uh, technology. Erki Huttamo yeah, is a quite famous uh, media archaeologist, and Martin Leuperdinger, a film historian, and Annie van den Uwe uh, from Groningen, uh, with whom I, I've co-authored quite some articles on the topic. So the result of this uh, project uh, will be published in, in one month. Uh, so uh, we have produced um, two volumes, uh, one called Doing Experimental Media Archaeology Theory. This one I, I co-authored with Annie because we have been yeah, thinking together for more than 10 years now uh, about the more, yeah, epistemological challenges of, of doing uh, that kind of hands-on history. And the two postdocs, Tim and Alexander, uh, produced the volume Practice, which gives lots of examples of yeah, how uh, we planned those experiments, how we uh, documented them, how we analyzed them, and what we can learn from them. So these two books will be uh, published uh, soon. Uh, what was important in this project that was that we thought about different kinds of experiments. So we were very much inspired by the work of uh, Hans-Jörg Reinberger, which you, I guess, all uh, might know. Uh, and um, Reinberger introduced that, that concept of um, yeah, experimental system. Basically, he studied uh, biology uh, and biological um, uh, experiments, but um, we were inspired by, by his work and refined uh, some of his uh, concepts uh, to the study of media technological uh, experiments. And what we did was to think about different types of experiments. Uh, first, what we call basic experiments experiments that really focus on the, the physical nature or the technical uh, functionality of a, of a camera or of a recording device. Uh, then second, uh, media technological experiments, which really look at the object affordances and, and the user uh, object interaction. And the third uh, category are performative experiments, because most of these media technologies uh, we deal with were media objects used in a kind of performative setting or in a dispositif that uh, uh, included yeah, users in, in, in many different kind of settings. Think about yeah, uh, the living room as, as such a setting in which the, the radio or the television entered, or uh, you can think about film, the film dispositif yeah, where you have a very special uh, setting, also spatial uh, setting, 
uh, and yeah, these three kinds of experiments, uh, we did them in a kind of systematic way during the uh, project. To give you some examples uh, for basic experiments here uh, with our partners, Karin and Ludwig vogel binek <clears throat> experts, uh, they do for more than 30 years now, performances also with uh, the Laterna Magica. Uh, and here they did really basic experiments. What does it mean to use different kinds of light sources in uh, a, a Laterna Magica? How does it uh, influence, yeah, of course, the brightness uh, of, uh, of the light, uh, the, uh, the transparency of, of the screen. So if you do it with candles, if you do it with uh, gas, uh, if you do it with uh, oil, uh, all of this we know from, from literature, uh, but to see really the, the differences and then, and then also even to measure uh, those technical and physical uh, qualities of the different uh, light sources is such a typical basic experiment that we did. And you see that you need also kind of experimental setting, which allows you to do that, uh, those things which uh, sometimes are, yeah, can be dangerous. Uh, so here dealing with, with fire uh, requires, of course, specific kind of also uh, laboratory setting for doing such experiments. Um, another example here for a basic experiment was a workshop we did on uh, uh, the uh, HMV uh, portable disc recorder uh, with uh, an, an, an old engineer, Sean Davis, who was uh, an important um, sound engineer uh, working uh, um, also with um, uh, famous, famous new music bands in the, in the 60s. And so here you can see that it was really about measuring uh, frequencies, measuring about uh, measuring wavelengths, about the, yeah, the performance quality of uh, such a recording uh, device. Then we have uh, the media technological uh, experiments. Uh, and here, uh, what we tried to do was also to, um, to build replicas. Uh, so uh, to understand really the functionality of, of an object and the affordances by uh, first the deconstructing in a way the, the original sometimes, yeah, the original uh, is so precious that you cannot really uh, do hands-on experiments with it. Uh, so what we did is partly uh, also to uh, scan, fully 3D scan uh, objects then uh, to produce models uh, of it, 3D models, and to print, um, to do 3D printing of these different uh, parts of uh, here of Kinora, uh, an early moving um, picture technology <clears throat> that was very popular, uh, to bring it then together and to test uh, the, the functionality in, in a kind of user uh, interface. Uh, Tim, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I have a little cold. Um, Tim uh, van der Heiden here uh, collaborated closely with a colleague from the engineering department at the University of Luxembourg, um, uh, Claude Wolf. Uh, and that was really fascinating to see that collaboration between the historian and the engineer and we had several uh, master students involved also in, in engineering, uh, working on uh, the 3D uh, replicas. If you uh, want to see more about it, please um, look at this uh, article they published in the journal Digital History, where you find lots of uh, also uh, sources that show you the, uh, the production of these 3D scanning, uh, the modeling and the, the printing that was, that was done. Another um, uh, collaboration with the engineering department was uh, this project by Alex on the so-called uh, Stentaphone. This was a specific gramophone uh, that was developed in the 1920s, uh, which was air powered. So you had like pressured air put 
into uh, the apparatus. And then a giant horn was able really to produce uh, the sound in, in a, in a, uh, in a yeah, great quality, but also in, in a volume that was able to organize uh, concerts with a few thousands of people, even open air. Uh, and uh, so we found many, many descriptions about this and we think, thought, okay, is, is this really, was this really done? And how does it work? And, and so we produced, Alex produced in collaboration with the uh, engineers, that giant horn. It's the biggest uh, object that the engineering department at the University of Luxembourg has 3D printed so far. So it took them uh, uh, weeks, uh, but we then really could, could test it and uh, explore um, the, yeah, the, the functionality in, in that way. The third category are the so-called performative um, uh, experiments. Uh, so here it's really about um, testing the use of media technologies in, in uh, settings that were um, standard at the time, like uh, here, for example, um, early film uh, animation technology that was shown in, uh, uh, in kind of vaudeville settings uh, as an attraction, as a technology of attraction. And uh, in 2011 already, uh, Martin Leuperdinger, who was one of uh, the members of the advisory board, uh, yeah, did a kind of public reenactment of that vaudeville uh, setting during the Schoberfauer. Uh, this is like the uh, big kermes, kermes of, uh, of Luxembourg. Uh, um, and um, yeah, here people participating at this show could really experience uh, the use of these um, technologies as they were presented in, in these uh, vaudeville um, theaters. Another example we uh, do, did, um, or I was involved, was at the Orphans Film Festival in Amsterdam. That was already in 2014, if I remember well, where we uh, yeah, staged like different historical dispositives of amateur film technology in home setting. And yeah, we performed this live on stage during a, a conference. And yeah, we made a little film uh, uh, and I tried to play this and hope you will see and hear this. Today, I would like to take you on a journey, a journey into the past staged as a media archeological experiment. <laughs> In the 1950s, it is the 1950s, and the Mavericks prepare for the big event, the screening of a home movie. After the Mavericks have carefully read all the instructions provided by the how-to manuals, the show can finally start. Oops, that was me, sorry. Staged as a... In the 1950s, it is the 1950s, a pair for the big event, the screening of a home movie. After the Mavericks have carefully read all the instructions provided by the how-to manuals, the show can finally start. Welcome to the 80s. Anita is now a single mom, living with her two boys. Hey, I have another idea. Let's watch a home video. No, no, a nice no, home video. It's a beautiful one. Let me see. Ah, that's you. Okay, that's the good one. 
I watched you afterwards. You remember? You were so cute. Oh, that's my crotch! Wow, well. it's so embarrassing. <laughs> I don't want to watch it anymore. Tom, what are you doing? Welcome to the digital age and final episode of our experimental journey. I would like you to meet our youngsters, Tom and Tim, 18 years old. No parents involved, no big screen used, neither a television set present. At the same time, New rituals and forms of sharing private images develop. New forms of social communities emerge and new ways of sharing or making the private public. It's hard to foresee how future generations of historians or archivists will recreate that simultaneity of making and screening and how we will be able to explore or reenact the particular, this particular moment in time. Okay, um, yeah, I could see some of the, the skeptical faces uh, here in the on the screen. The people in the room at that time looked also very skeptical to what we what we have been doing on stage at, at that point of in time uh, but i mean the the idea for for such a performance lecture was really to to demonstrate um, uh, the the kind of performative affordances of different kind of media technologies how they not only how it's not only about the technology as such uh, but about the social uh, um, social relations around uh, the use of uh, uh, or defining the use of technology, be it in a family setting, be it in a uh, in a, a home a living uh, setting, and how this changes over time. And then, if we want to understand, yeah, the past usages of of media technologies, we really have to. Of, to pay more attention, I think, to these performative uh, dimensions of, of the technology. And of course, this is a kind of, of, of very uh, uh, nearly uh, a caricature of, of, of these different episodes or different uh, dispositives, but it aimed at really sensitizing uh, the people and the audience for uh, that kind of approach. Um, and during the live performance, the lamp of the projector broke. So <laughs> we, the, the first, the first dispositive, uh, uh, yeah, failed because uh, the lamp broke. And this is, I think, has been part of the the reality of uh, people's lives uh, uh, very often. Uh, but you, of course, you don't find this in in, in the books. Uh, of course, we, we are not re reinventing the wheel here in terms of, of methodological approach of hands-on uh, history. Uh, we have been inspired a lot by works in, in experimental archaeology, uh, experimental history of science, uh, and even yeah, historical uh, performance practices in, in music. Or we organized uh, within the DEMA uh, project a workshop where we also had people from, uh, from history of medicine, uh, and, and many other fields that are history of arts and that are experimenting with that kind of hands-on uh, history. So um, yeah, what we, what we learned from all of that and what many of uh, the people doing that kind of hands-on history um, share is that believe that we need to deoritize uh, objects. Um, so in, instead of, uh, and I, I told you earlier that I come from the Deutsches Museum, uh, which is such a temple of, of, of science and technology. Uh, so we, instead of staging these objects as, as fragile and precious originals, uh, we um, argue that we need to 
really get into dialogue with uh, things and uh, we, we have to deoritize them by first opening up these collections. And as you know, in many of uh, such museums, um, most of the, the objects are not even shown, but are in uh, the, in the uh, um, collections hidden uh, somewhere. And uh, we argue we should, yeah, use those for, for experimentation and also open up the, the black boxes of, of these um, objects. Um, this deoritization is also a way of what Annie and I called a, a means for resensitizing um, us as historians. So by, by re uh, sensitization, I mean that uh, it helps to reverse the processes of, of habituation and routinization. Um, think about television or think about radio. Uh, we have become so, uh, so used to these technologies that we uh, have lost any kind of yeah, sense for the, for, this, uh, for the novelty, for the speciality, uh, for what these objects do. Uh, with our lives. Uh, so doing these experiments in a way, yeah, resensitizes us uh, for uh, sometimes this, um, yeah, moments of wonder and also even uncanniness that can um, rage when we deal with uh, media technologies. More importantly, I would even say that experiences of, of failure or, or of resistance uh, produce really an effect of, of learning and of understanding that you can hardly have uh, otherwise. So resensitization means um, really having all our senses involved, um, not only the hands, but of course it's, it's all our senses. And um, uh, one of the challenges is of course how to then think about uh, how to translate what we feel, what we see, what we hear into uh, research data, uh, so to speak, that we can then reuse for, uh, for our uh, analysis. So parts of uh, the project uh, was really thinking about modes and ways of documenting what we do. Uh, uh, documenting, uh, for example, what our hands do. Uh, it, during an experiment. So we played with different kind of camera settings with a GoPro camera, with a camera just looking at what your hands do, uh, recording uh, the, the sounds, the, the discourses uh, and so on. This is, uh, I think, really important because uh, it's uh, a generally a kind of um, documentation uh, process that we know from the history of science in, 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 a, in a journal, in a, you take note in a, in a research journal, um, in a diary, uh, but this is already part of the interpretation of, of what you have been uh, doing. So to keep that moment of wonder or a, a moment of uncanniness, it's interesting to yeah, experiment also with different forms of, of documentation. Um, yeah, so it's inspired, as I meant, uh, mentioned earlier, by this work also of uh, authors like uh, Michel Serre or, or Merlon Ponty, so the more phenomenological uh, a proud approach uh, to take our, our senses um, uh, serious. Um, what it also does is I think that it changes the way we uh, look at then the, the other sources we study. Once you have done such an experiment, um, you will look at hands-on manu uh, hands manuals, for example, or uh, at um, advertisements or as a technical descriptions of objects in a different way. So it really changes your analytical uh, lens uh, and uh, enriches in that way, I think, your capacity for uh, a more complex 
uh, a more nuanced historical interpretation of the past. And as important as uh, this, I think, is that it doesn't bring us closer to the past, of course. That's the, the big wish, of course, uh, of, uh, of all historians to get as close to the past as possible. Uh, uh, but it changes, nevertheless, I think, our historical imagination. Uh, when being uh, part of, uh, of such a performative experiment of and doing uh, such a, a basic or media technological experiment, um, you get a different sense of uh, what this object um, meant, maybe to past users. You will never be in their, uh, uh, in, in their position, uh, but it changes the way you imagine uh, the past. And of course, this is part of our um, hermeneutic reflection uh, that we have to do as historians to, to self-critically uh, think about how we imagine that, that past. So I'll come to, to my conclusions um, uh, to uh, wrap up with some somewhat general uh, reflections why uh, I think doing experimental media archaeology can, can be an interesting method, an interesting heuristic uh, approach to do also history of, of technology or history of media. Um, again, it's, it's not about uh, staging or producing authentic historic experiences. This is by definition impossible. But the heuristic potential, uh, I think, lies in the uh, creative and playful engagement with uh, objects. So the, the, the deoritizing, the learning that it uh, produces, and the kind of uh, sensorial um, uh, engagement it allows. It produces a different kind of, of knowledge, um, factual knowledge. Um, and yeah. In the book uh, that I wrote with Annie, of course, we, we talk a lot about uh, this concept of implicit, tacit knowledge, uh, gestural knowledge that has been discussed also in the field of history of science and, and how um, yeah, we can translate this to what we do in the field of, of media uh, history. Um, I think um, the experience of failure is uh, maybe one of the, the most, most important uh, lessons learned when, when doing uh, this hands-on history. Uh, it immediately yeah, destroys many of the success stories you know uh, by having read the, uh, the literature uh, or by having studied advertisements or uh, any kind of other uh, imagined uh, user uh, sources. And it sensitizes you for uh, the, the many problems, the resistance, um, uh, the uh, also necessity of, of, of maintenance and of repair that is included in the use of, of media technologies. Yeah, as I said earlier, uh, uh, it changes maybe our historical um, imagination uh, and adds another interpretive layer uh, in the production of our uh, narratives. Dema, uh, in this broader context of, of uh, experimental media uh, technology, I think what we could add to the existing uh, literature is to reflect more systematically on different kinds of, of experiments. So um, one experiment is not another, and one should carefully think about what kind of experiment one aims to, uh, to do and what the, the possibilities, but also the limitations are in these different modes of experimentation. Um, so this is something we, we try to do uh, quite systematic. And I think this is also the, one of the, the values of uh, the second volume by uh, Tim and Alex um, to describe 
I don't like the term best practices, but lessons learned for, uh, for planning, for organizing, for documenting, for interpreting uh, such, um, such experiments. And that's linked then linked to the next point, uh, also to see the value of this for uh, educational and for pedagogical purposes. So we have been uh, including such experiments in, in the classroom, in teaching. Uh, we, we did quite a lot of uh, public performances. Um, and I think um, hands-on history is a great uh, way of uh, engaging also larger audiences uh, with uh, what we do. Um, it can be a, f a form of public history uh, which uh, yeah, produces um, yeah, different kinds of uh, feedbacks and brings us, can bring us in, in touch with different, kind of, uh, different kinds of audiences. And for my students, um, it's, it's really eye-opening, ear-opening uh, when, when I make them play um, a, a, an Edison gramophone uh, of the late uh, 19th century when we do a really a recording on a on a wax cylinder and then listen to our voices afterwards or when um, I play um, a rock and roll a song on a tiny transistor radio of the 1950s on midwave uh, because they think that the, the 50s and 60s sounded like a high fidelity uh, sound that they they know from films so it really uh, changes uh, 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 the way that uh, students also think uh, um, or can think that about uh, media history and the history of technology. Yeah, and finally, uh, in the volume that, that I co-authored with Ani, I think we really tried um, in a kind of 10 years dialogue that we have been uh, doing uh, to offer kind of coherent theoretical reflection on the uh, epistemological and hermeneutic uh, dimension of experimental history in the field of, uh, of media history and history of uh, media technologies. And um, yeah, I would be very curious to, to hear uh, from colleagues in the field of um, yeah, history of science and technology, if they find this uh, possibly also useful for their, for their own work. So we have been inspired by, of course, that tradition of, of experimental history of science a lot. Uh, Rheinberger and others, the Oldenburg School. But I think we also have been uh, going one step further, especially when it comes to thinking about um, yeah, documenting such experiments uh, uh, and what it can uh, add to uh, yeah, thinking about uh, history and uh, what it does to our uh, historical imagination. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I wasn't too long and I will stop sharing so that you can or I can see you.